I'm Tony Edwards, and welcome to The Burning Log. I live in Phuket, Thailand, and like many people in Southeast Asia, my main form of transportation is by motorbike. Now, many people here do it because they can't afford a car. For others, it's a matter of convenience. In any case, the reason is definitely not safety. Thailand is the deadliest country in the world for motorcyclists. It's estimated that 5,500 people die every year on motorbikes. That works out to about 15 deaths a day. And as someone who has been involved in a fatal motorbike accident, I can tell you that the danger is real. Ironically, that accident, which occurred in the United States, is part of the reason that I'm here in Thailand today. And yet, here I am, riding a motorbike every day, and I love it. I know that I'm not alone in that. There is something universal about the lure of riding on a motorbike. So the question is, how can something so dangerous be so seductive? There are three reasons, three ingredients, which when mixed together, make riding on a motorbike such an intoxicating cocktail. The first reason arises in us before we are even born. As humans, from the moment we are conceived until the moment we are born, we exist in a state of selflessness. But once we enter this world, all of that changes. We become a someone, someone who must immediately learn to breathe to stay alive and deal with blinding lights and hellish sounds. It's, it's like being waterboarded with life. And after floating weightlessly for nine months, we are suddenly introduced to gravity. And what a shock that must be. As we grow, part of us remembers what that feeling was like. We long for it. This is why when our parents lovingly toss us into the air, we are delighted. It's as if we're saying, oh yeah, I remember this. Not long after that, we realize that we can generate those feelings on our own, initially by simply jumping up and down. We realize that feeling of delight can be achieved whenever we experience gravity that is unlike the normal pull that comes from below us. And then throughout our adult lives, we seek to find that feeling from the womb, that novel gravity. Novel gravity is an unconscious longing to return to the state of weightlessness and timelessness we lived in before we were a person. As children, we find it on playgrounds, then on roller coasters. As adults, we continue to seek it by jumping out of airplanes, scuba diving, or riding motorcycles. Now, if you ask people why they love motorcycles, you're likely to get similar answers. They'll say that they like the feeling of being intensely focused on what is happening in that moment. There's no thoughts about past or future. Their lives depend upon being completely involved with the now. And although they may not realize it, what they're doing is they're forcing themselves into present moment awareness through that activity. And in doing so, they inadvertently stumble upon the gift that only exists in the present moment, the joy of being. Eckhart Tolle describes the joy of being this way. When a thought subsides, you experience a discontinuity in the mental stream, a gap of no mind. At first, the gaps will be short, a few seconds perhaps, but gradually they will become longer. When these gaps occur, you feel a certain stillness and peace inside you. This is the beginning of your natural state of felt oneness with being, which is usually obscured by the mind. With practice, the sense of stillness and peace will deepen. In fact, there is no end to its depth. You will also feel a subtle emanation of joy arising from deep within, the joy of being. The novel gravity that arises from riding on a motorbike is so seductive because it comes from multiple directions. We even have a name for this feeling, G-forces. 
When compared to the g-forces experienced when riding in a car, the difference is dramatic. A motorbike can accelerate much faster than a car, pushing the rider back as they go faster. When a motorcyclist negotiates a corner, they must lean their bike into the curve at an angle that would result in falling on their side if they weren't moving. In this way, they can defy gravity. On a motorbike, novel gravity is combined with novel sensory input. Novel sensory input is when you sense something and gets your attention because it is unusual or because you didn't expect it. If you were thinking of something and someone set off a firecracker not far away, your attention would immediately go to it and, if only for a second, to the present moment. Perhaps this is why setting off firecrackers is part of the Buddhist tradition in Thailand. Hundreds of little explosions, each one saying, pay attention. When you're riding on a motorbike, you are awash in novel sensory input. You can feel your own center of gravity shifting from moment to moment. You can hear the sound that the bike is making, and you can hear the sound of the wind as it brushes past your ears, even if you're wearing a helmet. You can feel the wind on your skin and on your body, and you can smell the air in a way that you cannot in a car. And on a motorbike, you must pay close attention to the present moment if you are to survive. And yet, you're not frightened, you're exhilarated. Your mind is given the opportunity to do what it does best, to analyze data and make choices based on a torrent of sensory input. Useless thought of past and future are pushed to the side. Everything is happening now. Right now, I'd like you to stop this video and take a mental inventory of your immediate physical environment. So, what did your present moment include? Now, for most of us, the zone of immediate physical awareness is fairly small, perhaps a few meters. And even as you move around, that zone of awareness stays fairly small. You may be able to see a spot on the ground 10 meters away from you, but it doesn't carry very much importance. However, if you were on a motorbike traveling 50 or 60 kilometers per hour, that spot would become very important. It's different from being in a car, which creates its own zone of awareness. You are aware of other cars and traffic controls, but you are shielded from the air, sound, and physical energy that you would be subject to if you were on a motorbike. And if you are a passenger, your bubble of awareness might be the same size as the one while sitting at your desk. On a motorbike, your now bubble, as in things you need to know about now, expands. It stretches out in front of you as you go faster. It starts to be shaped less like a bubble and more like a teardrop as your awareness of what is behind you lessens, only catching it in fragments in your rearview mirror or when you hear someone coming up from behind. And the faster you go, the more time seems to slow down. This is the seduction of speed. Imagine that you lived in a world that had alcohol, but no one knew its effects. People would go out and drink, and for a while the booze would make them feel great. And then after a while, they didn't feel so great. They'd get sick. They couldn't walk. They'd get into fights, or even worse, automobile accidents. Their friends would shake their heads and say, I, I don't know what happened. He was happy, laughing, having a great time. Then this, it's so weird. That's why it's so important to understand why some of us are so, well, addicted to motorcycles. We know that we like the feeling we get when we ride, but if you don't know where that feeling comes from, then it's the start of a, well, excuse the pun, <laughs> a vicious cycle. Going fast feels good, but like any other addiction, after a while, a certain level of speed just doesn't cut it anymore. You need to go faster. Maybe you go out and get a faster bike, and then a faster one still, until the day you end up going too fast. When you go fast and stretch that bubble of awareness out in front of you, it distorts the present moment. It's like looking into a carnival mirror, except you don't know it's a mirror. The 
third element of the seductive cocktail of motorcycles is ego. When I use the term ego, I use it in the sense that Toll does. He describes ego this way. The ego is a derived sense of self. It needs to identify with external things. It needs to be both defended and fed constantly. The ego lives through comparison. How you are seen by others turns into how you see yourself. How you are seen by others becomes the mirror that tells you what you are like and who you are. The ego's sense of self-worth is, in most cases, bound up with the worth you have in the eyes of others. It is very quiet in my little neighborhood, and late at night, all I can hear are the sounds of frogs, crickets, and air conditioners. But every once in a while, from nearly a kilometer away, I will hear the sound of a very loud motorbike going down the main highway. Some young Thai men will take a very basic Japanese bike like 100cc and modify it with a really loud exhaust. Now, if you ask them why they do this, they'll say that it makes the bike faster, and perhaps it does. However, if they're honest with themselves, they will admit the fact that they like it because it is loud. And here is the intersection between sensory awareness and ego. These young men like the sound because it is loud, but they also like it because it brings attention to their motorbike and, by identification, to themselves. They know that when they speed down the highway, hundreds of people can hear their motorbike, can hear them. Motorcycle-derived ego is hardly a Thai phenomenon. One could easily replace Honda Wave with Suzuki Hayabusa, Ducati Monster, or basically any Harley Davidson. The only difference with those last three, however, is another indicator of ego. They are all expensive and or exclusive motorcycles. For people who are closely identified with ego, their motorcycle must be not just faster, louder, or more expensive. It must be more so than those of others. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ride motorcycles, or even that we shouldn't go fast. We are here to have the experience of being human, and that means sampling all of the experiences available to us, aside from the ones that do damage to other human beings. What we can do, however, is to become aware of why we do what we do. The key is to become aware of your thoughts. If you can ask yourself, why am I going this fast? And the answer comes back, because it feels good. Well, <laughs> then at least you're going fast consciously. And then you have a chance to ask yourself other questions like, well, do I really need to go this fast? Is my ego involved? When you slow down and do so consciously, you get a much richer experience of the present moment. Stretch out your awareness in all directions. Look, listen, and feel without naming. When I ride, I allow my brain to do its thing, analyzing the constantly changing situation, and I become aware of what it is doing. I become aware of my own awareness. In this way, riding a motorbike becomes a spiritual practice. But the most important thing to remember is this. Ultimately, the joy that you get from riding a motorbike is the joy of being. That same joy can be found while sitting on a park bench, watching clouds, or even brushing your teeth. All that is required is that you become aware that you are. To realize that beyond name and form, the essential you is awareness, consciousness. You will realize that the joy doesn't come from the ride. It comes from you. I'm Tony Edwards. Peace.